After six months and hundreds of millions of kilometers, NASA's InSight spacecraft is expected to land on Mars tomorrow. The landing itself requires a high degree of precision, and if it is successful, it will kick off two years of study about what lies beneath the Mars surface. For more, we're now joined by Farah Alabe. She's a NASA systems engineer working with InSight. She joins us right now in Pasadena, California. Farah, thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. So, you know, we have talked about InSight on and off for, for a number of months now, but what makes InSight different from other spacecrafts and other missions? So InSight, while it's a Mars mission, is actually completely different from all the rovers that we have currently on Mars. The rovers have been looking at the chemistry, the geology, and have been sort of scraping the surface of Mars. Whereas InSight is looking at Mars more globally as a planet. So we're really studying the, in, the interior of Mars. Uh, we're looking at the Martian structure um, using our seismometer and our probe. Uh, one of the really neat things with InSight um, that I like to joke about with my friends who work on the rovers is they have a little scoop that maybe digs down or drills down about this much. We have a probe that's going to go down the surface of Mars by five meters, uh, and it's going to look at the heat that's being emitted from the interior of the planet. So quite groundbreaking. So ground, quite literally, as it goes down into the ground yep. some five <laughs> meters. But, you know, as you say that, uh, InSight, as we've been noting, has been traveling without incident for a number of months now. And in covering these stories in the past, I know that the landing can be tricky. What kind of things have to go right for the landing to actually be successful here, Farah? Yeah, I think tricky is an understatement. Uh, it's extremely difficult. We have, um, I call landing sort of a very well choreographed dance where you cannot trip in one single place. Um, so we're arriving at Mars at 5.5 kilometers per second. Uh, we have to hit the atmosphere just right, uh, at just the right angle. If we're too steep, we'll actually burn up. If we're too shallow, we can bounce off the surface, the atmosphere of Mars. Um, then as we enter, the heat shield is going to burn at 1,000 degrees Celsius. It's incredible heat. So any flaw in our heat shield could cause the probe to break up. Um, then when we're about eight kilometers from the surface, we deploy a parachute. All sorts of things can go wrong with parachutes, right? We're going really fast. It's, it's going to cause us to, uh, to wobble a little bit. Um, Following that, we have to get rid of the heat shield, and then we pop out our legs. And then the scariest part to me is when we're about two kilometers from the surface, we actually cut the cord to our parachute. We separate from our parachute. I mean, you would never do that, right? Yeah. Who does that? We <laughs> have to do that because we need to separate from whatever the parachute is causing, you know, whatever physics the parachute is causing us to see. We actually are in free fall for like a split second, and then we fire up our retro rockets, and that is what slows us down. By the time we hit the surface of the planet, we're going at less than 10 kilometers per hour, so very slow moving car at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but that whole sequence yeah. from that 5.5 kilometers per second down to the surface only takes six and a half minutes. So wow, so a lot of choreography in a short amount of time. Absolutely, yes. And it's all pre-automated. It's actually nothing we can do here from the ground because it takes about eight minutes for the speed of light, which is the radio signals that we're getting, to come to us. By the time we get that first signal that we're entering the atmosphere of Mars, InSight will already be on the surface. I mean, mm -hmm. in one piece or many, that we won't know. Uh, but it's too late by the time we start hearing from it. Um, there's nothing we can do. Well, you know, of course, we'll be watching. I'm quickly running out of time, but I do want to cover a couple more questions with you because we have to note that there are two mini satellites that are actually trailing InSight, and you worked on those mini satellites. Explain the role they're going to play and why they're important here. Yeah, so the MARCOs, the, the two little mini satellites, are a technology demonstration mission. And what they're going to do is, in addition to MRO, which is one of the big spacecraft in orbit around Mars, the two little spacecraft that are going to listen to the radio signal from inside as it's landing. Um, so if everything goes well on landing day, they will actually get that data. And unlike MRO, that will have to store it and will send us back the data four hours after landing, the little MARCOs will actually send us that data in real time. Um, so it'll allow us in the mission control room, you know, as we're sort of sitting there biting our nails to get more information about what's happening from InSight and get all the details of what's happening uh, during the landing sequence. So mm -hmm. it will allow us to confirm a safe touchdown much earlier than we would otherwise. Okay, so in information much quicker than before. Uh, then very quickly yes. then, overall, what do you want to do with the information? What is the hope with the information that you're going to get from InSight and this landing uh, and this probe into the Mars surface? 
Um, so there's two sets of information. First off, whenever we land on Mars, we learn more about the atmosphere. Um, so there's an extra data point about what it's like to land on Mars, and that's incredibly useful for us, not only for future Mars missions, but also when we're looking at sending humans to Mars, right, we can, we're developing those landing systems from that data. So it's incredibly important to us. We've only done this a few times. And then in terms of learn, learning about Mars more globally, Mars is a rocky planet like Earth, but it's much smaller. It evolved differently, right? And one of the questions we ask ourselves is, why is it that Earth became the way it is and it's a habitable planet and Mars is this, is this harsh, you know, place where we could never live? And how has it evolved and why is it different? And what that could tell us is it could give us a better idea of how rocky planets evolve. So, for example, if you're looking at exoplanets and looking at a, um, a planet that's the size of the Earth or the size of Mars, that extra data point could actually give us an idea of, well, okay, this planet might be habitable or this one might be more Mars-like. Um, so it's essentially an extra data point into us understanding how rocky planets evolve. Farah, it is always great to speak to uh, smart people such as you. Thank you for the time. <laughs> You're welcome. And that is Farah Alave, a NASA systems engineer working with Insight.